I was bummed that I... You didn't get to make it out there? Yeah. I mounted the scope and I got sick. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of uh, Bushnell in Focus. It's the week before Christmas. I don't even it's the week before. It's like five days before Christmas. So hopefully that means you're at home at Washington with family and friends, or if you're still at work like the like the rest of us, um, I guess maybe have a little break. But uh, got a very special guest with us today, um, Todd Workman from the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism. That's a mouthful. You guys ever thought about shortening? that thing up a little bit so maybe it's yeah i always go kdwpt <laughs> yeah that makes it so much more easier for some guys like to figure out the acronym so todd thanks for coming man I Glad appreciate, to have you on. You. appreciate you having me here yeah man so um we do a lot of work with the kansas department of wildlife parks and tourism um from a bushnell perspective we're obviously working to grow that out a little bit more um one of the things that i was really excited that you're able to come on and talk to us about is the ask program the kansas ask program which is the Adaptive Sportsman of Kansas. Um, basically, what you guys have been able to do, and, and feel free to jump in here at any time, but you have uh, obtained through a grant to purchase uh, four or eight, eight electronic all terrain wheelchairs that will be housed in each four corners of the state so people with disabilities actually get to go out and hunt and fish. That's correct. Uh, uh well, I was up at a uh, uh, trade show up in Minneapolis, and I uh, had a gentleman approach me. Usually, up in, uh, when you're uh, representing Kansas up in one of these trade shows, everybody loves to come and hunt Kansas. And uh, uh, ninety-nine. Can't imagine why. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the people that come tell me tell us how much they love to hunt Kansas, how friendly we are, and and then you'll you'll have that point one percent that are going to come up and tell you what's wrong. And uh, uh, the point one percent was represented by this uh, older fella in a scooter that rolled up and proceeded to just read me the right act about the fact that we didn't have a program, a, a track chair program in Kansas, and uh, I didn't know what he was talking about. And so he started explaining to me what they were, and I it kind of planted a seed in my mind. At the same time, I was thinking he looked familiar, even though he was up in Minneapolis. Right. I couldn't quite figure where he came from and and then all of a sudden it dawned on me that this I was talking to Bud Grant who was the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings for ever and I said well heck you're Bud Grant and he goes yeah that's right and <laughs> he gave me his card and I said well you might not know this but uh, when I was a kid I'm, I'm old enough that I can remember my Kansas City Chiefs uh, whipping you guys in Super Bowl 4 I can remember Otis Taylor high stepping down the sideline and I thought he was going to come out of that. Uh, but uh, uh, two things I learned, you know, some people just can't let go of certain sure. things. Uh, like you couldn't let go of that defeat. But uh, And also, but the legacy, main legacy was, is he planted that seed in my mind to come back and start looking at what a track chair program was and found out that Missouri actually had one. Right. And so I called uh, uh, the Department of Conference conservation for Missouri and, and got a hold of folks that uh, initiated the track chair program there. They did it a little differently than us. They uh, they had a pretty good boost from Johnny Morris uh, from yeah. Bass Pro Shop. That's a familiar name. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we went ahead. We, we thought it was a good idea. I got a, a really good core team together of uh, this real go-getter named Jessica Rice uh, as the uh, program coordinator, and then Nadia Reamer and, and Mike Miller as the core team to start getting everything together to launch this program. And uh, we also got a, 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 a PR grant for 160000 to, to start Very nice. that. And uh, we did, like you said, we started, we've started our program with eight chairs and four trailers, and we've put them in, we're, we're in the process of putting them in all four corners of the state. And um, we're just trying to get an opportunity, getting opportunities together for folks with disabilities to be able to yeah. go outside and enjoy the outdoors. We, uh, that's just something we've been messing out on. Sure, uh, that's uh, really cool. And we need to offer that opportunity up. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, that's a, that's a great way for people of all ages, uh, families, disabled veterans, I mean, what an habit to get back out there in the field. So I commend you guys for doing that. Um, it sounds like, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing article after article pop up. There seems to be a lot of demand. Have you guys maybe underestimated the, the public demand or the people that have been reaching out about, you know, trying to uh, get permission to use them or working with you guys on events? seems like the outpouring has been very... 
I, I think it's, I think the program's going to have to expand, which is a which is great. A, uh, darn the luck. Yeah, heck, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that that's a heck of a bad deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we just uh, got done with our first hunt. We actually hosted up on my farm um, um, with the uh, Pay It Forward folks. Uh, Mike Burns heads that group up, and and uh, Chad Johnson and was a sponsor for Rick Messer that came out. All of them were in a part of the Pay It Forward program, which is a great uh, veteran program, disabled vet program. And Rick was able to come up to the farm and spend uh, a few days cool. and get deer in front of him every day. And then uh, he, of course, waited till the end when the rain was pouring down to uh, uh, go ahead and shoot, which uh, we gave him a little uh, crap about. But uh, the bottom line is, is he had a great time. And and uh, the chairs got put through the absolute worst possible. Yeah, a little uh, bit of snow that weekend here, that, right before that hot came. It's perfect for hunting conditions, but I was kind of curious how the track chairs would. And you guys said that was no big deal. They just plowed through everything. Eight, eight, eight inches of snow with some three foot drifts, and it just sat right over the top of them and ran. And then, how cool! By the last day, the pouring down rain had caused everything to melt and turn to mud and. It made it through the mud a heck of a lot better than I did. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that was a cool hunt. Uh, we actually had one of our product managers, uh, Greg Pakowicz, got to go out on the day before. I think you met Greg. Chad was going to go, but came down sick and get out there. But uh, well, we were happy to be a part of that event. Um, it was neat to, to see a veteran get to go back out there. Somebody who would, or I would heard, I mean, obviously he'd speak to him, but a lifelong hunter, somebody who would always you know, want to do that. And then it was his opportunity. Always wanted to hunt Kansas. Yeah. As you talk to everybody, everybody teams that want to hunt Kansas, yeah. but to get out there, and then it was awesome that we get to play a, a small part on our end. He got to use some of the, the new Engage binos and an Engage rifle scope, and then shot a nice buck in the doe. So that's a, that's a great story. Yeah, and a range finder, too. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the range well, finder. Don't forget yeah. about your stuff <laughs> uh, when you get into that. But, yeah, it was it was a great experience for me, too, you know, and I I just got to say that I always say thank you for your service when, when sure. I meet up with a veteran, but uh, being in a blind with guys for or, or three or four days will uh, 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 give you another realization that what you're saying isn't, you don't know a dang thing about what they went through. Uh -huh. And it's just uh, shocking. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, it'll have new meaning for me next time I say that. No doubt. That's, that's probably one of the things that I've been most uh, pleased with as far as our industry is how vocal and how uh, outgoing um, the shooting sports industry has been to not only veterans but to a lot of different groups about uh, finding opportunities to get people back out in the field because uh, it's, it's a passion. Like I said, you just don't get rid of it. And uh, fortunately, things happen to people uh, and they lose that ability. So you guys find it in different ways. The industry find different ways. I mean, shoot, there's, there's a hundred different organizations now that I know that have reached out to the hunting and shooting groups to help fuel projects, Wounded Warrior Project, uh, have a hundred veterans uh, a field. I mean, there's a bunch of them that have happened lately. It's just good to see. It's, yeah. It's cool. I mean, it's it's an industry that's made up of passionate end users. And so when those end users get into a role at a company where they can manage funds and move things around, it's really a good opportunity to share that passion exactly. with people that wouldn't otherwise get out in the field. So, I mean, so tell me about these, these track chairs, because I've seen some of these things at SHOT Show. Some of these things look like something, you know, like the Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator would drive. I mean, can you walk us through these things? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, this, I mean what, what, this thing, like, it comes equipped with, like, a rod holder and a gun holder and a place to put your beverage, maybe. I don't know what it's all got on it, it but it's it, a... It has that. It has, of course, <laughs> of course it does. <laughs> well, they're built, they are built like a little tank. Uh, they're only about four foot long and, and about three and a half, four foot wide, and they weigh about 400 pounds. Okay. Zero turn radius. They got the big tank treads on them. Like I said, they'd go through any kind of mud or, or low water or uh, over logs or boulders. or They got wheelie bars on the front and back to keep you from tipping over. Okay. Easy to run, a uh, simple joystick up front, uh, takes two seconds. If you if you weren't familiar with how to run one, you could be an expert in 15 seconds on it. And it's got the, it's got power tilt up and down, so and, nice. and the right and safety harnesses on it. And like you said, all the all the ways to, to get from point A to point B, to either to fish or to hunt. 
Uh, we're also getting ready to spend some extra money to get remote controls for them so that someone Interesting. behind you can run the chair so that if someone, like they were pheasant hunting and, yeah. and had to have a gun in their hand, the person behind them could run the chair. Stop so it that, moving forward so they can kind of pay attention on. Yeah, so they wouldn't, you know, when pheasant gets up, you don't have to yeah. uh, get. The, right, stop the machine, put it in park, or stop what you're doing. And stop and get, get try to get the gun but You don't out. get that much time, unfortunately. No. I not, need that much time to hit a bird, but. Well, I mean, <laughs> just like it's still. Just, <laughs> <laughs> if that's legal. Uh, but uh, uh, not only that, but uh, but it's not just for hunting. I mean, also fishing or uh, things like that where you might have uh, some disabled kids that want to go fishing at a pond during some kind of event. And yeah. uh, um, instead of them accidentally being able to hit the joystick and, and sure. get too close to the water, that you have somebody behind us running the show. Cool. So. so all electric, right? So you don't have to have a gas powered. I mean, these things are running off of electrical. You guys have generated. In the tra- in the van, the uh, trailers to keep them powered up. Yep, yep. Uh, if they need it, uh, okay. they'll go five miles without a charge. And we put that one to the test, and it was about four miles, and still had two bars left on it. So I think the five miles is pretty close yeah. to criteria. Very cool. So how, how does this program like? How does somebody take advantage of this program? Who do they? How do they reach out? How, how do they get access to them? I know it's a it's kind of not necessarily a first come first serve basis because you guys have got some regular and stuff and keeping them in, but how if somebody's watching right now and they're going, hey, I know somebody who wants to get out back out in the field in Kansas, uh, who, what do they do? What do they get hold of? Well, uh, Jessica Rice is the uh, program coordinator out of the Kansas City District Office, and um, uh, the, the numbers for the, for the ASK program are on the, we- our on the website. Page. Okay. So, uh, and then call, and then we put it on the calendar, try to give us 30 days notice, um, and then uh, if it doesn't conflict with another event, then we'll... Uh, We'll approve it. It just has to meet those criteria. Sure. We uh, we like to be a pre-approved event um, um, that's sponsored by a company or an organization. It can be Boys Club, Girls Club, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, uh, Pay It Forward, uh, um, any of the any of the organizations, a church group. It doesn't matter. And we've got another hunt plan with you guys. I think right. We've been talking about maybe a turkey hunt. Get the uh, the bone collector boys if they're watching, Nick or Travis or uh, Michael out there. To call some turkeys, I think those guys can call on a turkey. I don't I know if that, so. old, that show on Primos channel. I don't know where. Yeah, maybe I, the guys from Primos will come, but I think the bone collectors can call on a turkey. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's uh, <laughs> if that's pre-recorded uh, stuff or not. That sounds pretty good. Uh, but yeah, uh, you, the next turkey hunt is actually at the uh, the, the uh, Timber Hills Ranch. Joe Bazone has offered up his ranch uh, for two disabled Kansas hunters to go out and hunt turkeys, and then. Um, I've talked to Chad and Eric from Hooray Ranch, uh, yeah. and uh, uh, I've talked to Chad, actually. Eric's reached out to me, and I haven't been able to get a hold of him, but I think we're going to get something going with Hooray. Very too. cool. Well, Chad and I are going on the turkey hunt. We'll, we'll, we want to be out there, so if oh. you can find a – we don't need a track chair, or maybe we do. I kind of want to get in one because I see those guys driving around a shot show, and then it's – I mean, I don't know. But it look, it's an amazing piece of machinery. I'm just amazed that, like you said, the zero traction, I mean, and zero rotation, and just yeah. So if you can maybe, can you bring an extra one out there so we can, I, I so we can try it? Brought one with me this time. You guys <laughs> That's what we needed. Just what all up and down the hallway <laughs> here. Just Matt sits, and I get the joystick. There you go. Well, I, I wouldn't want to be in the chair when somebody else is around the joystick. You guys go ahead. You trust each other that much. We had a we had a question from uh, from Facebook. Laura Elizabeth, who um, is is yeah, we uh, know that name. We do. We Laura. King's thank wife. you for the king's the king's wife. <laughs> um, so she she had two comments. One, I need this said machine for PRS matches. So oh. you can cruise around at a long range shooting match. <laughs> but her her other question: How disabled does the veteran need to be to qualify? They don't really need to be disabled if they can't get around. I mean, but it just has to be an approved event. So if you've got if you got some older gentlemen that are that are going to go to an event, uh, whatever, whatever it is, but they just can't get around, like oh, uh, I, I could take for an example. Uh, uh, maybe a grandpa that can't walk anymore, but he'd sure like to take his grandsons uh, down to that fishing derby. Yeah. Uh, that's the kind of event that we would jump at. The, the worst thing that could happen, I think, for this program would be to have these chairs idle when, sure. when there's sure. a need out there. So we'll do what we can. Uh, but in, it, that's it, it doesn't ha- you don't have to be disabled. You just have to not be able to get around. I would have a limitation on there. Yeah. So whether you, you uh, may be suffering from uh, COPD or something, 
something where you're just respiratory problems and can't walk as far as you need to or need that kind of extra assistance, these chairs, you could qualify to use them. So it doesn't have to be a, a paraplegic or something like that matter. No. Yeah. It just has to be a pre-approved thing. Yeah. So, you know, just to, uh, for everybody out there that's listening, I mean, there's a lot of private individuals that want to go on private hunts, but they have to understand that the uh, these are in – state trailers and so we have right. a state person transport them out so, there. so it's kind of got to be in advance so that we're not tying up uh, assets that uh, that just for one individual so we're, it's not going to be like the rental bike program you see downtown where we've got track chairs just littered around kansas city where you just jump in one and go a little ways and then park it i wish it could be like that but that, that's not the way it's going to be i understand <laughs> it shouldn't be that way but I had to ask so, what, Two, like, two other yeah, uh, just questions going running right through right. the uh, the Facebook comments. Michael Burns from Operation Pay It Forward. Thank you to Todd and everyone at Bushnell for allowing OPIF to be a small part of such an amazing program, as well as your dedication and support to our nation's veterans. So um, from the Bushnell side, thank you, uh, Michael, for, for having a program oh, yeah. for us to support. It's, uh, that's a really cool opportunity, and we're really happy to be involved. You know, Michael Burns is A-plus number one in my book. Yeah, we got to talk to him a little bit. Um, sorry, Michael, that the, the, the firearm getting in here wasn't as quite as easy as I hoped for, but I'm glad we, we got that settled and everybody worked and the gear worked great. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate everything that you did on your side to get this going. I know that's, that's no small feat to, to coordinate the logistics of a hunt and get somebody involved. There's a lot of boxes you got to check and a lot of things, and you're not just doing it this time. You pay it forward, does it uh, across the United States with a lot of different events. This is just a, a small in our neighborhood type of event they were doing. But you guys have uh, I mean, you mentioned some of the ranches and outfitters, but on this last one, didn't he, um, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember the name of the tax service, but a gentleman offered his services uh, for the hunt. If, if the veteran were to shoot something, that he was going to do the taxidermy. That's really cool. Yeah, Bailey's Taxidermy. Uh, Bailey's. Um, I know it's out of the Wichita area, but I don't know exactly where, but he's offered up his services, and they sent him the uh, the the head. Uh, to ha I think a European mountain. Yeah, that. and uh, he just did that free of charge because he heard the program. So very cool. Um, yeah, I, it, it's great of uh, Bailey's Tax for doing that. Yeah, very nice, very nice. So let's let's we'll put the ass program a little bit to the side because I got some questions I've got to ask you because I, I know there's probably some people that want to ask some questions but they probably figure you're a game warden so they're maybe they're hiding <laughs> some previous uh, previous things that they did on the line but what is I mean you've been doing this for seven years working with the State Department. So, I mean, what is probably one of the most wild, outrageous things you've heard of as far as like an event happening or, you know, something, you know, you guys get reports. I mean, I heard, uh, you know, like the, uh, on the, one of the Kansas hunting and fishing groups, there are rumors that you guys are putting out mountain lions in Kansas to, to control the deer population. So are you, are, I guess we're asking you, are you guys releasing <laughs> mountain lions in Kansas to control the deer population? Uh, if, if we are, and they haven't ever told me. <laughs> the, the answer really is, is absolutely Absolutely not. Uh, uh, and uh, if we put mountain lions out, I'd be scared to go into the woods from then on. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, that, that absolutely not the case at all. Uh, I think there's been 19 confirmed cases, if I recall the number correctly, confirmed sightings of actual mountain lions okay. in, in uh, Kansas. And um, Matt Peak uh, kind of uh, hit or he always heads up the investigation on any sighting. And there's never been a confirmed sighting of a mated pair or or a uh, or a mountain lion that's taken up residence. So uh, Matt is is uh, hypothesizing that these are just males traveling through. We can kind of, he kind of tr you can kind of see him tracking in and out uh -huh. of the state as they're as they're moving along trying to trying to look for a mate. Uh, I suppose, but uh, so far we've never confirmed any any uh, cats ever taken up residence. Interesting. So on the report wise, along that line, have you heard anything that beats that? Are there any kind of fairy tales about what you guys are doing secretly in dark rooms and plotting stuff, or you know, moose spottings, or well, I mean, anything there, like anything along those lines? There was a confirmed moose sighting in Kansas uh, a <laughs> long time ago. Uh, uh, a young bull that was on the Kansas River that was that moved down through. But I don't remember what year it was, but I remember reading about the paper. That was long before I. And then we did have a wolf get killed in Wakini. Uh, that was a confirmed wolf. Uh, and it's mounted actually out at uh, um, 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 
Goodland at the travel center out there. Hmm. Uh, after we got it back from Fish and Wildlife, they went ahead and did the DNA testing on it and confirmed that it was an immature male wow. wolf from a from a release up in Michigan, I believe. So, um, and other than the Bigfoot uh, sightings from 12 years ago, where they uh, the fellows actually came out, the group actually came out looking for the uh, Yeti and. Uh, then they left without saying anything, so I don't think they they found one out. See, you must have been reading my questions over here because yeah, I, I know there's nothing out there in I'm West gonna Kansas. Let you, I wasn't going to let you bushwhack me on there's, that. There's not a lot out there in West Kansas, so I had to ask, is, is Bigfoot real? Can you confirm or deny that on, on Facebook Live today? Is, is Bigfoot real? The only, Please uh, don't say he's not real because I would just crush my child. Anyway. Well, I, I won't say it. Though, <laughs> I've been looking for a Yeti for a long time, but they're just too expensive. <laughs> I think you can buy them at the store for yeah. like $14.95 for yeah. the small Yeti. Yeah, $14.95 with a decimal <laughs> point behind the five. <laughs> okay, so, we, no, so no Bigfoots. We did have a question here. Have you seen an increase of koi wolves in Kansas yet? I know there's been individuals found in Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, etc. No. Okay. No. <laughs> Pretty simple on that one. No. Right. Sorry, man. No, not having on there. <laughs> so uh, along those lines, I mean, I mean, what what have you seen in your seven years as grown? I mean, as far as wildlife and a whole for this kind of not necessarily Kansas, but looking at Kansas, Missouri, have you seen any trends? I mean, like bald eagles. Uh, I've seen I think more bald eagles, not necessarily in Kansas, but in Oklahoma. Uh, in the last four or five years that I've seen, you know, previously in my lifetime. So I didn't know if there are some trends like that of some non, um, what's the word I'm looking for, non-typical animals here that are coming in. Have you guys seen any of those type of trends like that or any? Um, you know, there are a lot. There, there, there are just a lot more bald eagles than there used to be, which is a tribute to the conservation efforts across the world, really. And the reason you're seeing more of those is just because there is more of them. Yeah. I, I believe they've even been taken off the endangered list. So, um, as far as uh, in Kansas, I mean, the fluctuation of pheasant quail and the the rising and falling of those populations are, are something that's interesting how dynamic they are. Now the quail are coming back uh, pretty good, pretty fast, and, uh, and showing the, the dynamics of those populations. So uh, they could turn around in a hurry. So. So, so when you guys look at something like quail populations and deer populations, you guys are actively going out each and every year, or maybe not each and every year, you're schooling on this, but how are you doing those population surveys? Are those done um, Are those done through spotlights with, with wardens, or are you guys doing you know research like every two years, every five years in order to, to establish populations? How's that, how's that process kind of well, fared out when you're... Well, with birds, I mean, you got several different ways they do things. They do lek counts uh, for what? for prairie chicken lek. Okay, that, that's a that's a a group of chickens. Um, they do crow counts for pheasants, uh, quail whistle counts. Later quail in the year, the counts. So yeah, just, somebody goes out and whistles and well, they listen, how many responses. They listen to whistles. They can. They, I suppose if I was out doing it, I'd have to whistle. I'd have back. to whistle back. I yeah. know, but you can't count that one. <laughs> and and uh, the rural mail, uh, mail care. They also do counts also. Um, and uh, the spotlighting you're talking about has to do with uh, deer counts, and we, they, do, they do do spotlight counts in, per region okay. uh, for deer every, annually also. So all these things are annual things that they do. So you do them annually, okay. Yeah. So I want to back up. You said rural rural mail carriers. Rural. Rural mail right. carriers. I know so, you're trying to make fun of me now. No, no, that's oh. how I, I say the same thing. Okay. I get picked on all the time in the office. <laughs> rural, oil, other things of that nature. Um, so the mail carriers themselves are actually doing a count while they're mm -hmm. driving their routes? Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I'd never thought about that. No, they they do. That's what is that something they're volunteering to do, or do they work with you through some sort of program? To, uh, you know, I don't yeah, know. I don't. I, I, I don't. I do not know the answer. That's interesting that they're doing. That's cool. That's very cool. They're out there anyway. I yeah, yeah. Probably right. right, 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 right. Yeah, it's probably a passion of theirs that they enjoy doing. So uh, we were, I was doing some research. Um, I, I have somebody in my own life that helps me do some valuable research, and she mentioned to me that you guys have got two new state parks that are being added this year. So that's that's pretty cool. What what can you tell us what they are, where they are, where they're at, and what opportunities there are for any uh, outdoor enthusiasts in the area? There? Yeah, Little Jerusalem is a, 
our newest one, and then also uh, the Flint Hills Nature Trail. Um, it goes from Osawatomie to Harrington. I think it's 117 miles, and I think that's the longest trail, wow. continuous trail in the continental U.S. Wow. So uh, uh, Little Jerusalem, if you've ever been to the Badlands of South Dakota, it's like a, a small cross-section of the Badlands. You wouldn't even think it would be in Kansas. Kansas. And it is, a, it, it is a really, really neat uh, neat place. And the, uh, we worked with Nature Conservancy to uh, um, make that so that it, it, it could be a park and, a, and available for public uh, use. Where's that? It's out uh, just, I think it's just north of Scott City. Okay. That, seemed, that sounds really cool. Yeah. Oh, definitely. it's a, it, it's a neat place. Yeah, to the go. Badlands is, in, I mean, yeah. they're incredible. Right. Yeah, you uh, you know you can get into the park for uh, five dollars at Little Jerusalem and just uh, take a look at it, or you can get a more in depth thing by getting on a guided tour. But uh, it's a neat place. So one of the other questions I wanted to ask you was kind of um, um, regarding licenses, and I think there's kind of some misunderstandings with some of your annual licensing of like how that goes into effect. Can you break that down? Like if I go buy a deer license. It's good for a full year, but it's not just the calendar year, correct? Well, not a not a deer. Oh, not a deer life. That's a bad example. Yeah, the so deer that's why I'm asking the questions, good. not answering. Uh, the hunting license is good, uh, or a fishing license, or a fur bearer's license is good from the day you buy it for 365 days. So as as opposed to a calendar year, um, it was determined uh, uh, back when I was doing research on auto renew. Um, I, I, it came to my attention that uh, uh, having an annual license kind of uh, affected our churn rate, which our churn rate uh, is a term for people not buying a license every year. Okay. Yeah, uh, which is a, which is bad for us. I mean, people that normally would buy a license but only buy it maybe once every three years. It's called a churn rate. And so, in order to reduce that churn rate, we started looking into ways of doing that. And one of the ways was to was the 365 day license because uh, people didn't have that discretionary cash at the end of the annual year because of Christmas and the holidays. And uh, so, we wanted to make it so that you got your value every yeah. time you buy it, and that you didn't have to buy it at the end of the year if you bought it in in uh, on October 1st. It's, it'll run all the way through that hunting season, even though our hunting season go past the calendar year, you don't have to try to find a place to buy one in January. If you didn't have enough money, just not buy one. We wanted to allow you to have that opportunity. That was my dad's secret tip about hunting birds, hunting pheasant in Kansas. He said, buy your, buy your license in January, and that way you can come back and hunt the early part of the year and not have to buy your license again. So yeah. not, you're not really double dipping, but you're just getting more more hunt time on a license. I was like, that's a pretty good way to do it. Yeah, and then along with that, then uh, uh, in a uh, concert with that, we launched the uh, Auto Renew, which allows uh, a person to auto renew their you know have the credit card on file and have those privileges auto renew so they don't have to remember when they bought it right right yeah, they're going to get they're going to get reminders of when they bought it uh, or letting them know that we're going to hit that credit card is it okay to hit that credit card again this year is these, are these still the privileges you want and once you click okay then when it comes around you'll get the new license and 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 uh, uh, never have to Sure. Think about well, it. Yeah, think about it. You just, so that's another good churn uh, strategy for us. So, you know, I'm not from Oklahoma. Chad, I'm not Oklahoma. I'm from Oklahoma. Chad's not from Kansas. Uh, Wayne's not from Kansas. Why? Why would you encourage somebody to come hunt Kansas or to come fish Kansas? I mean, what, what would your what would your recruitment speech be for somebody who's looking around the map? Because I know a lot of guys that do that. They look like I haven't hunted here yet, or I haven't gone there. What would be your your pitch for them to come come check out Kansas? Well, it's a, it's the best place to hunt whitetail probably big whitetail and uh, with over a million acres of uh, walk-in hunting which is private land that's open to public hunting you don't have to ask permission uh, so your pheasant deer uh, opportunities even for especially for out-of-state hunters that may not have the inside track on land is is great and uh, you know I go to a lot of trade shows and and people come and they look at these Weehaw atlases and they, they see how much land is available and it's just unbelievable. You know, and uh, even when we're in South Dakota, and I hope there's nobody from South Dakota listening, but, you know, when I was up in South Dakota, I mean, uh, their limit's three on pheasants, our limit's four. And we have a longer season, so if you want if you want to get into more birds and you come to Kansas, so there's your pitch. That okay. I, I pitch all the time. I, 
when we don't have a problem getting people to come into Kansas as far as, uh, I mean, we always sell out right. our permits. So. But, you're, but like, even like for your out-of-state deer license, um, you have a good percentage to get to get drawn, even though, you know what I mean? Isn't that, is that correct? I mean, it's not... Whitetail-wise. Whitetail-wise. Yeah. Yeah, so that's you correct. have a good percentage of, of getting drawn if you yeah. purchase Yeah, depending that. on your unit. I mean, you always you always uh, put in for your unit and an adjacent unit, and it doesn't matter if you don't get the unit that you... Um, Primarily, yep. did if you get your adjacent unit, then you can hunt and you can either, hunt unit, either unit that's on your tag, listed on your tag, uh, you can hunt. So interesting. That's good. That's good. Good to know. So where where do you, where do you like to go? Where where's your little secret hunting hole in Kansas? Do you mind you mind telling Chad and I so we can maybe go there after work today or something? Well, I mean, I love hunting pheasants around Scott City, and I love fish for crappie in Clinton and Perry, and uh, and I love to quail hunt. But I, I can do that anywhere up around Valley Falls area, you know, which is where my farm is, and a, a lot of private ground up there. But there's also a lot of public ground that is loaded with quail also. Eastern Kansas is a good place to go for quail hunting. Um, I've gotten into them pretty good down at around uh, John Redmond Reservoir, uh, Melbourne Reservoir, and the public hunting areas down there. After, uh, after the first year, nobody touches them. That's a good time to go. Noted. We write write that down. First of the year. <laughs> what, what you I actually need a pen or yeah, I'll give you a pen. What, um, one of the questions, like when you talked about how much public walking land, how does that compare to some of the other nearby states? I mean, is that is that on the leading end of states as far as the walking area, or are we about in the middle here in Kansas? Do you have an idea of I, how I, that kind of competes nationally? I, that I, seems like a lot. I uh, I think that uh, it, it's one of the leaders, but I, I couldn't uh, tell you for sure. Uh, I know that uh, uh, with a lot of the CRP ground being lost, in, like in South Dakota again, and they lost a lot of their walk-in hunting up there, I, I don't know where they're at. Uh, but I know that uh, ours grows or kind of it kind of stays the same or grows a little bit every year. I think it, I think it's pretty close to 1.1 million acres wow. now. Wow. And those atlases are free. Uh, it, it, you know, when I go to these trade shows, that's the thing we ha hand out the most of are those hunting atlases because all you got to do is show them how much ground you got that you can that you can uh, hunt uh, without permission, and they're they're all over it. So we we talked about some of the other the species from from whitetail to to pheasants to quail. What about hogs? Are we we have hogs in Kansas. Is that is that one of those other one of the rumors? What, do we have hogs here? I mean, we have had, story. I'm sure that there are a few hogs in Kansas. When we uh, discover that there are, we we have them eradicated. Well, we don't want hogs in Kansas, and uh, uh, the states that have them probably wish they would. And I know there's probably some outfitters in those states that are. <laughs> Making a lot of money sure, off of them, sure. but, but as a state, you don't want those, and and we we're doing our level best to keep them out. So when we do have a, a concentration of them, we we have them eradicated. So if you just tuned into uh, Bushnell and Focus, uh, we're here with Todd Wordman for the Kansas Department of uh, Parks and Tourism. If you've got a question uh, regarding anything, uh, game laws or survey counts, uh, licenses, registrations, uh, whatever you guys uh, might have, throw them in the comment section. Uh, if we don't get to them during today's broadcast, we'll be sure to, to answer them later. So, I mean, Todd, what, what's been your biggest enjoyment or what are the things you're most proud of um, during your seven years that you've kind of helped? Help set up here during your time with the uh, department. Well, I worked in cost communications before I uh, before I joined uh, this team, and uh, I had a pretty good group there. And uh, when I came here, uh, I didn't think I'd ever have a group like that. But the thing that makes this working for this department unique is the the absolute passion of. Uh, Every employee, uh, they're they're living their dream job. Uh, they're working their dream job, and uh, when you're working with passionate people like that, it, it just makes it just a, a joy to. Yeah, it's contagious. And, and and you know, it's just like this: the ask program. You know, uh, you show it to uh, an LE group. Uh, down south, I think it was in Melbourne where we showed that, and immediately went out on their their Facebook page, and immediately we started getting traction. So, you know, it's it's programs like that and people like that that are just up and down the whole agency showing that passion that uh, that make it uh, make it a special place to work. Just a uh, just a real pleasure to work for with folks like that. Sure, most definitely. 
So we've got a bunch of guys on our team uh, who are kind of getting into the hunting. And some of the questions that we had, some guys wanted to build. So let's take coyote hunting for existence. What would you recommend? What do they need to know for somebody looking in Kansas, Missouri area, going to get into Kansas, going to get into, get into coyotes? So, like, can you can you lay out the ground rules, what you need to what you need to do as far as a license, you know, maybe a little bit of equipment, permission, laws, regulations, thing to keep in mind for coyotes? Well, I can try. I, uh, you know, uh, coyote hunting, uh, you know, most uh, farmers don't care for coyotes too much. That's true. Especially cattle farmers. And uh, um, there's plenty of walk-in hunting, although you do have to be careful when you're looking at the atlas about what you can and can't use for weapons uh, when you go on the search. But it's pretty well spelled out in that atlas. It's very well spelled out in that atlas, what you can and can't do. Uh, the only thing you really need to hunt coyotes in Kansas is a hunting license. Uh, with any other fur bearer, you would need a fur bearer license, but coyotes are the exception. You can just have a hunting license uh, to hunt them in Kansas, and they're prevalent throughout the state. There's, there's no, uh, they're very well citified. I mean, they they can survive well in the cities. You, of course, you can't shoot them in the in town in, in the city limits. And sorry, Melody. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but they're they're very wily. You know, I I suppose I get in trouble with Warner Brothers for saying that, but they are they are a sneaky <laughs> sneaky ki- uh, thing a coyote is, and very intelligent. But uh, fun to hunt. Oh uh, yeah. I'd call in with a with a um, woodpecker in distress or a dying rabbit call. They 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 are a fun thing to hunt. Um, so no no bounty on coyotes here in Kansas, right? So they're like compared to other states. No we bounty. ever had a bounty program in Kansas? That I believe that they have, but I, I, I I'm pretty sure that we have at one time, but we don't have a bounty program anymore. Okay. And can you hunt? Your, can you hunt, use uh, um, artificial light? Is that a lot? That's not a lot in Kansas as well either, right? No. Okay. So. Sorry, guys, if you're out there with your spotlights trying to get that late mangy coyote. <laughs> better, better not do that one. Is it, day, really is, it, one. is it day hunting only for coyotes? No, not, no night hunting? Not with uh, night scopes. No. Okay. Not, not, not with artificial light. Thermal? thermal. No. <laughs> all, the, all, all the fun toys that we enjoy, thermals, <laughs> night vision, artificial lights. All your you good guys good. over there in the department are just cutting out all the fun. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you were telling us some stories earlier today when you came in that I thought was pretty interesting about, you know, how some of these animals have kind of adapted to the city infrastructure. And, like, you are mentioning Topeka and, and some of the wildlife. I mean, can you elaborate on that? I mean, what, what you've seen, you must have seen some stuff. I mean, raccoons coming out of city drains. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think people sometimes just underestimate how much wildlife has had to adapt to us, you know, so they, they've made the best they can in certain situations. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, animals in, uh, that live in the storm sewers and, and culverts. And, and uh, I know I, I one of the stories I had was I did have a family of foxes move in underneath my, uh, my back deck and raise a family there. Um, they like cat food, by the way. Um, but they do, uh, you see them on the golf courses in town. Uh, foxes, they're, they're real adaptive. Uh, all these animals are raccoons. They'll knock your trash cans over at night. You might blame the dog for them, but uh, uh, they live in the storm sewers along with skunks and possums and every other scavenger you can think right. of. But they're highly adaptive to uh, uh, pavement and, and uh, finding spots where they can where they can live and survive and breed. You guys have also had some interesting uh, things with, like, goose roundups and stuff. I, I don't know if you've been directly involved, but some of those, I mean, it seems like you guys get some calls about people wanting the, the goose off their property and different things like that. Uh, I, that might just be the, my inside my inside knowledge of the department. But you guys get some interesting calls there from people, like, when stuff happens. I'm sure that's probably a, a good humor talk around the water cooler is that somebody had a, a bobcat sighting that they needed you to come out or an angry pigeon that they needed you to deal with. Well, I, I'm not going to comment on pigeons, but, and I can't comment on a goose roundup because I don't know what the heck that is. But uh, as far as, uh, you know, bobcats and mountain lion sightings, you know, people send in pictures all the time. And, and more times than not, it, it, on a mountain lion sighting, it'll either be a house cat or a, a bobcat. And, it's a big house cat. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, they, they're seeing it on a trail camera, not taking it in a, the 
where they're at and uh, count uh, relative to size, and so then you got to go out and investigate it. But uh, we do get a lot of uh, sightings. The flea collars usually give away. Yeah, the, the thing that says Biff on the collar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, did we miss any questions? Did anybody got any uh, license questions or regulation questions? We can hit Todd with while we still got him on. So, yeah, if you're just tuning in, again, uh, another episode of In Focus, uh, Todd Workman for the Kansas Department on Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism. If you got some questions regarding uh, opportunities to hunt Kansas, uh, seasonal dates, like I said, their website's a great source of knowledge if you're thinking about cutting in Kansas. Where's the best place you find it? I mean, you hunt and fish all over, and don't say Kansas, but where outside of Kansas, what is your favorite place that you've been hunting? Well, uh, hunting, I, I, I don't really hunt a lot outside of Kansas. Uh, fishing, of course, I've okay. fished all over, but and I, I outside of Kansas, northern Ontario is the place I like to go. Fishing? Uh, fishing, yeah. And what are you fishing for up there? Walleye Northern. Wow. Uh, I'm too far north to fish for smallmouth. Sorry, sorry, Mike Miller, if you're listening, but <laughs> I know he's a smallmouth guy, but I'm, I'm a little too far north for the smallies, but uh, that, that's, a, that's a great place to go, but uh, there's no place like home. Uh, no doubt. So where are the fish biting? Well, they're, they're, catching, the bite on that? they're, they're catching right now at Clinton and Perry, I know, because my we, dad's out today right now. What are we catching? Crappie. Crappie. Yeah. Just he's jigging over brush piles next to the channels and just killing them. So so we get an invite to come out there, the, the Bushnell team, to go crappie fishing? Anytime you want. <laughs> I've got a boat that my wife says is underused, so <laughs> there shouldn't be any reason I can't say yes. You can't take it out and go for a yeah. while. Uh, we're going to take you up on that. So, Chad, do you have any other questions, man? You, you, you had some things coming in you wanted to ask. I don't know if we hit yeah. on them or not. So we had one from uh, Dusenberry Ra who said he'd like to see some new glass. I asked what he meant, and he said new high-end scopes. He hadn't gotten a chance to see them. All right. So you just want to show, show them at least what we got on the table? Yeah, so up here in front of us, we've got some of our new hunt line. Uh, we've got a, uh, a sample from our nitro line as well as from our prime. Uh, these are two of three families that we introduced this year. Uh, some great responses of the products that have been out there in the marketplace. Uh, so if you're looking for a, a new hunting op uh, optic uh, for this year uh, or next year, uh, look no further than Prime Nitro Forge. So it's kind of a, a good, better, best, if you will. Uh, Prime is kind of our entry level. Uh, you're looking to kind of second focal plane only, um, uh, one-inch tubes, and just kind of real, one of the things that we prided ourselves on on Prime Nitro and Forge is exo barrier. So exo barrier repels water, oil, fog, dust, uh, debris. It's an oleophobic and hydrophobic coating. Uh, we talk about it a lot on the show, but it's really impressive stuff to see it in action and how it works. And then when you take the step up to nitro, uh, a little bit better glass, you get first and second focal plane. Uh, this right here is one of, this is the uh, uh, 5 to 20 model uh, cap turrets. Uh, everything on the scope is IPX7, so it's completely waterproof. Something that we went up and above on. Uh, optional sunshade on front if you want it, uh, but it's phenomenal glass. Um, ability to reset the turret, uh, too, if you're a guy that wants to do some dialing, uh, I want to take off the scope cap, or, or, and then take your dial and return it to zero. Uh, we do, have on our higher end, have ED Prime glass, uh, and some of the patent coatings, uh, not only on just the rifle scope, but it's a full family of spotters, uh, laser range finders, and binoculars, so I was the bridge version. You want to yeah. get into more details? No, I was just going to say, <laughs> that, that Nitro is very similar to what we put on the rifle for the disabled veteran hunt. It was. Um, that we did for the track chair program, so I think we used the 4 to 16 version of that uh, for that program. Yeah, so all the hunts that we're going to be doing with uh, the Kansas Department of Wildlife will be using some of the Engage and then some of the uh, Prime Nitro Forge out there. So giving everybody a little bit of a taste of some of our new optics. You got to walk around a little bit today and see what you think of the the lab and the press of the guys working on there. Is that what you thought about when you thought about building optics, or was that kind of new? I never thought about it, to tell you the truth. I, but, uh, Just pick them it, up and use them. It was pretty, yeah, it was pretty interesting to go in there and find out how complicated it was. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, it's something we take a lot of pride in, but it's also our passion. You talked about the passion that, uh, that your folks here at the office, but that's what we love to do. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's our passion to, to do this. So um, I'm going to scan through here and make sure we didn't miss anybody's questions. There's there's two here. One, right, right. one, one for each of you. Matt? 
Does Bushnell offer a military and first responder discount? So we are working on that program right now. Um, it has not been finalized yet, but we will be offering a uh, military and law enforcement appreciation program. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please drop us a message on Facebook. Uh, Wayne and I will get to those, and we'll get you set up in the meantime. Happy to do so, but we'll have an official program announced, hopefully around SHOT Show, uh, a little bit after that, uh, with all the full details on that. And then the other one... Are there tags through Kansas for out-of-state disabled vets? And if so, what is price and process to get one? No, there's not. Okay. Uh, they have to go through the same process everybody else does. Uh, there, there are some disabled vet tags. Uh, I, I take that back. There are some disabled tags in, in Kansas for, and that's actually what we utilize for Rick. Uh, I don't know how many there are. And uh, uh, we're the process for selecting them. But uh, Mike Miller at uh, the main office would... Uh, be the one to talk to about that, and that, that number is uh, 620-672-5911. That's his personal cell, right? Yeah, that's his personal cell at home. <laughs> no, that's the main office of Pratt, <laughs> and just ask for Mike Miller, and uh, uh, he'll be able to set you up with, uh, uh, with what the criteria is on that. Awesome. So cool. Two more quick ones. Yeah, yeah, let's get them, man. First one, comment George Gardner from GA Precision. Sticker looks good. We agree. <laughs> Thank you, George. Thanks for being on uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and then the other one, uh, Duesenberry Raw, no 8x32 forge. Uh, correct. So for the forge binoculars, we have a 8x42 and a 10x42. We just released a 10x30 uh, folding binocular, which might be a good fit for what you're what you're looking for something more compact and then there will be a 15 by 56 high power binocular that we will start shipping next month so just after the new year you should start seeing those in the store so yeah, we need to get you out doing some long range shooting with us. I think you would enjoy that. We'll trade some hunt tags and some honey, secret honey holes for some long range for some long range practice. Well, I think holes work. might be something I could do. Something <laughs> I don't know about that tag business. <laughs> Come on Good. now, Wait, you know what you said earlier. Wait, you said that we can try to slide that in. You just tried sliding that one in there. I thought you said a lot. You didn't think I was listening. <laughs> He's always trying for something. Yeah. If you're not trying, then you're not you're not competing in that way. You're not cheating. You're not competing. <laughs> All right. So if we don't have any more questions, we. We've got kind of our uh, honorary lightning around here. So what we like to do with our guests is kind of put you on the spot and kind of dive into the mind of Todd Workman and just kind of figure out what makes you tick, all right? What's the rating on this? <laughs> Pass or fail, it's really it's really up to you. So what we're going to do is I'm going to hand a list of questions to, to Chad. Awesome. Some of these, um, you know, we've, we've kind of tailored them to some of our pro staff and shooters, so you might, um, might be as applicable or not, but we're just going to run through this and then uh, see what you say, okay? Is so I, the, if I, I don't know a good answer. So if you if you don't know any good answer, is a good answer. That works. All right, all right. But you, the purpose is just to answer as quickly as you can. Don't give any forethought to it. Just just belt it out, all right? That sounds dangerous. All right. So when we look at reticles, middle or MOA? Middle. <laughs> we'll, we'll take that as a middle. All right. Good job. <laughs> Hot dogs, mustard or ketchup? Both. All right. Yes. <laughs> that, that's an interesting sidebar, but we, we've learned that you are 20% more likely to be a serial killer if you eat ketchup and mustard on your hot dog. And you got me in a bunch uh, in a place with a bunch of guys. <laughs> Good job. Um, toilet paper roll, over or under? I don't care. As long as it's there. <laughs> Semi-auto or revolver for carry? Um, semi. Shotgun or rifle for zombies? Shotgun. And are there zombies? Yes. <laughs> Do you guys take account on those? <laughs> no, there's no limit. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a bounty program? They, there will be. Oh, Perfect. Per, per year. <laughs> if they have one. Dogs, dogs or cats? Dogs. A red dot or rifle scope? Rifle scope. All right. Spring or fall? Spring. Hmm, I would have guessed wrong on that one. Nine millimeter or forty-five ACP? Forty-five ACP. Right. Comedy or horror? Comedy. Cake or pie? Pie. <laughs> He Lots said that pie. one. He said that one was a passion. Uh, I got pie. His eyes got glazed. Holidays, man. Yeah. I guarantee you, my family tell you I have a pie safe in my basement. <laughs> That's Thanksgiving. I, the pie I bring home goes in the safe so nobody else can have it. That's true. <laughs> Ford or Chevy? 
Chevy. Yeah, think about that one. No, I want to make sure I get the right answer on that. <laughs> I've got a GMC right outside. <laughs> All right, so this is a fill in the blank. So we're going to read a sentence, and then you can kind of fill in the blank here. So if you could go, uh, we'll change this one up a little bit. If you could go hunt on a hunting trip with one person, living, dead, or fictional, who would you go with? My grandpa. Very good. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Flying. Nice. What, your biggest fear is? Crocodiles. <laughs> Wait a minute, we might have to buy into that. Uh, How does someone just naturally get a fear of crocodiles? Well, you know, anytime I'm going to have a nightmare, that's how it starts. With a crocodile. I'm in the water and the crocodiles come for me. And if I, could, <laughs> if I could wake myself up, I wouldn't have a nightmare. But if I can't, then them crocodiles are, they got me. <laughs> so I told you, this, this really dives deep into the minds of our guests. All right. Sorry to sidetrack there, but I had to ask. No, that's all right. The best thing about hunting is... Uh, being outside. I hate it when I go to my tree stand and... It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Has that happened to you before? Well, yeah. I mean, I, people people steal anything. They lock up. <laughs> Jeez. The one thing I always bring on a road trip is... Beef jerky. My biggest pet peeve is... Repeating myself. <laughs> I've always wanted to go to... Um, Australia. Right. And uh, your favorite Bushnell optic? Well, I like the binoculars that I got from here, but I forgot what the heck they were called. <laughs> we got we to gotta get a better marketing guy on here to make you to educate you about our product. I, I don't remember the name of them, but they're great. They're clear. They're and engage. Engage. That's it. <laughs> engage. Perfect. I love them. Well, very good, Todd. Well, we appreciate you having your on. Um, for all of you guys and everybody at home, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We probably won't be on next week, uh, but we might. We might surprise you with a little bit of a after holiday in focus show. I think uh, Chad's got a Santa costume. He hasn't broken out in a while, and uh, I got an elf costume. And we'll get we'll, we'll get the whole crew in here doing something. So yeah, we'll all call in from all four corners of the country. <laughs> but Todd, thanks for coming on, man. Glad to have you and chat with you. Thanks. Hopefully, we'll get you back in after we all go crappie fishing and uh, cow down together, and we can we can tell some tales then. Well, that sounds good. <laughs> all thanks right. for having me. Thanks. All right, thanks everybody.